We have a number of questions from our audience, and I'm going to try and get to some of these. A woman asks, should schools incorporate the impact of slavery and police brutality incidents into the curriculum at an early age, like middle school? Hmm. Anyone? Elementary. Elementary school. Yes. That's not too early. Just like, just like U.S. history. Yes. Another question. Um, so that, this is so that, do you believe that corporate responses are sincere and that real conversations are taking place in CEO offices? Some. <laughs> some, <laughs> no. some are definitely not. Um, yes, I actually, I do believe some are sincere and people are trying to figure it out, partly because uh, I think anything that impacts a lot of your employees is problematic. And so I think, uh, I think organizations are trying to figure out what are they going to do? Uh, so yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been involved in some of those conversations that I think very sincere and, and backed by effort and time and money and strategy. And then some are not. Hashtag Black Lives Matter, put out a statement, everybody's good and move on. And you keep your head down. I think there's a third tier of put your head down, don't say anything, don't do anything, try to stay out of any kind of line of fire uh, and hope that nobody kind of holds you accountable on any front. Um, so I've seen the range, I think all of us have seen the range of those responses. But yeah, I do think some are sincere. And again, a lot of it driven uh, by black employees, African-American employees within those organizations who say, having an employee resource group, having an affinity group is good. It's not enough you know, we have to do what we say we're going to do. And, and often when I speak to some of these groups, I'll just tell them, why do you bother with a mission statement? Like, this is the opportunity to live your mission statement. And if you're not going to, then, then don't. I mean, it's fine. Just know that you can't manage to live your mission statement and you should stop talking about it. It's your organization. Do whatever you want. Um, but I think it's, you know, this, this is the time where people have to make a decision about what they believe and what their values are as a, a corporation or as an organization or as an industry. I think journalism is going through a very similar thing. You know, we wanted to have lots of conversations about diversity and justice and fairness. And then you're like, yeah, let's look at our numbers for the last 20 years. <laughs> They're not good. They're terrible in many instances. And so, you know, it requires a cold, hard look at yourself frequently. Uh, another very good question is coming this how important is the conversation and the movement for reparations to make, change, make the change our society needs to make? Um, Congresswoman? Well, I think it's absolutely critical. I do think it's tied in with other issues though, all related. One, learning US history. We like only the nice stories. We wanna hear about the cherry tree. With George Washington, we don't wanna hear about the 300 Africans that his family owned. Um, I think looking at the society's institutions, unfortunately, I think reparations, and I wish I could come up with another word, I think reparations has been ridiculed. And I think it's been ridiculed to say black folks just want to check, as opposed to the profound examination of inequity in our institutions and a study of how to rid that inequity and then how to cure it, how to remedy it. That is what reparations is about. And I, I do think uh, it is very, very important. But again, to me, I would tie it to getting rid of institutional racism. Um, another very good question uh, from the audience. Uh, and this one I'll ask you, Steve. What can local elected officials do, especially those who live in really conservative communities? I, I think that... Uh, if, if I can uh, speak as Steve Milliken, uh, you know, we, we've got the so-called leader of our country who is tweeting a video of a white supporter calling for white power. If we don't register people and get out the vote and put people in office who will affect these changes, uh, I mean, we have enormous capacity and tremendous advantage in this country in the last two months. If I can just go back to reparations, I'm not here to say what form that should take. Uh, uh, but we raised $2.2 trillion over the COVID for stimulus in two months. It, it seems to me that we can have a serious effort to raise uh, consequential sums 
to deal with the original sin of America in slavery and the genocide of native peoples. Um, so I, I think getting to the, getting people registered, having people fill out the census, getting people, the census, having people get to the polls and voting to get the right people in positions of power uh, is the single most important exercise of a civil right this year. A uh, interesting question from a black female who says that she is the CEO of a corporation and she wants to know how she can use her position to make a meaningful difference. Any suggestion? Yeah, number one, everything comes from the CEO. If the CEO doesn't take it seriously, then no one will take it seriously. Number two, uh, make sure that you're holding your employees accountable. I many years ago did a, an interview with a CEO who talked about moving from a diverse slate hiring, which was always like wink, wink, diverse slate. We put some people in, but we hired who we wanted to and starting to actually judge people and pay them. They didn't get their bonus if they did not hit whatever the definition of diversity at the organization was. And because the CEO was behind it, he said, you know, I only had to do it once. I only had to give one person less than their bonus. And he said, after that, everyone understood that it was real and it was serious. And we had a goal that we were trying to meet. If you, if you treat justice and fairness and diversity and inclusion within your organization like you would treat if you made refrigerators, how you make refrigerators, right? You, you track it, you figure out what's wrong when it's not working. You, when people leave your organization, you don't just say, well, I guess we have a lot of black people who are leaving. You track it, you care, you wanna figure out what needs to be changed in the organization. That's all stuff that a, a CEO can do. And then I think the last piece of that is step back and let other people lead, right? Empower the people around you. You know, it is very important to you. You are the CEO. This is an important, essential mission because if she doesn't take it seriously, no one else will bother to take it seriously. And then make sure that your underlings are now coming up with solutions. It can't be the black woman CEO pushing the, the solutions. It has to be all of her employees who want to be involved in this conversation making change. Congresswoman, there's a question for you. Um, uh, from uh, a person in the audience says, part of this moment is the increased awareness in the mental health community of race-based trauma. Uh, how can BLM inform changes in mental health care legislation? How can Black Lives Matter inform? Um, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I you know, I, I mean, I think we definitely need to have mental health. I, I think maybe what the person is referring to is the microaggressions and a stress from race. I mean, racism is a public health issue. You know, you wanna, everybody found out, by the way, it was a, a really um, surprising discovery that African-Americans have disproportionate rates of high blood pressure and diabetes and, and other illnesses. All of those illnesses are stress related as well. Stress impacts those illnesses and racism causes tremendous stress. And so that might be what that person uh, is referring to. And I think that, you know, in the richest country in the history of the world, we should have free medical care and it, there should be parity with mental health as well as physical health care. And I think people also, if I may add to that, have to understand, we did a documentary about stop and frisk in New York City. Uh, and we profiled a young man who had been stopped about a hundred times. Described how painful it is to be pushed up against the wall of a building and have someone search through your backpack when that building is your college campus and your professors are walking by and trying to articulate the, the, the sheer humiliation of what it's like to be stopped and frisked and for, it happens consistently to him. Um, and I think sometimes like I've spent a lot of time as a reporter trying to make everybody who doesn't understand it like, to really understand the depths of what it means to feel afraid for your life, to teach your children how to survive a police interaction uh, from about the time that they're 13 years old, and, and how devastating that is, and what the mental implications are of all of that. It's really, really difficult. It's actually why when you are talking about when do you start you know, teaching this to students, I don't know. There are days when I think some of these conversations are really tough. Uh, and I, so I don't know when you start talking about these issues to, to you know, is middle school? I don't, I don't know. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I think it's really important that people begin to understand 
the impact that systemic racism has on people. And I also, the word white privilege, words, white privilege are not a words that I like particularly because I think for a lot of white people, they don't feel very privileged. And so they think of that as, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, you're saying I'm better than you in some capacity and they don't feel it. And I, I actually wish we had a better way of explaining and talking to people about the benefit of your skin color what that buys you in a society that is basically a racist society. I have found that white privilege takes a lot of rounds of conversation uh, for people who aren't having intellectual discussions about it, for people to really understand. And, and I, I, I find that a little challenging. And Steve, there's a question that uh, uh, someone asked of you. What are the best ways that individual white citizens can raise the issues of systematic racism with their friends? I, I, I would say just talking to every single person uh, that, you know, a white person uh, meets with, whether it's family, friends, the proverbial, you know, calling racist remarks at the Thanksgiving table, you know, when you experience uh, racism, uh, and you see something, say something, uh, and and I and I and I think also uh, having uh, some seminars. Uh, for example, uh, I learned from Nicole Hannah Jones in that article that at least 6,500 black people were lynched from the end of the Civil War to 1950, an average of two a week for nine decades. Now, fast forward nearly five black people on average have been killed a week by law enforcement since 2015. I think people feel that that history of slavery and Jim Crow and lynching is ancient history and we've moved so far beyond it. But the, uh, the number of black people killed by law enforcement today is two and a half times what it was between the Civil War and 1960. Which, which brings me to an, uh, another question from our audience, which I think is a very good one, which is part of the progress that was made in South Africa is that the government acknowledged and admitted its racism. Representative Bass, does, does that need to happen here? Absolutely it needs to happen here. I mean, it's shameful. It's just shameful that we can't acknowledge, we don't even admit it happened. We can't acknowledge 256 years, 100 years, we can't even acknowledge, we can't pass a law, a federal law against lynching. It's 2020. We tried to pass that law about three weeks ago. Rand Paul, one senator, held it up. So, you know, it's very hard to deal with these issues if your own government will not even acknowledge. Now, I'm hoping, you know, in 128 days, we have an opportunity to get past some of this mess we've experienced over these last three and a half years. And I'm hoping that the next president will be able to say, we did this. We could learn a lot from Germany, I think. We could learn a lot from Germany. We could learn a lot from South Africa. So, you know uh, that, uh, and I know you know this, that when the apartheid, when the Afrikaners were gonna set up apartheid, they came here to study the South. They spent time in the South and said, let's see how they do it there. And then they went back and started apartheid. Indeed. Um, it, it's, it, so is it just um, that people are in, den in denial or is it active racism that um, people just don't, I mean, for instance, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell made just an incredible statement yes, uh, among many that he makes, but he said that America had paid its debt for, for slavery by electing Barack Obama. Well, and added on to that, he said that his ancestors owned slaves and so did Obama's. So they were equal. He also added that on as well. So your question, is it active or is it denial? I mean, you have to have some level of knowledge to have denial. I would say the majority of Americans don't have the basic knowledge. And so I do think there are people, there are people here that I work with who, I mean, they're going to argue over why we had the Civil War, okay? So, you know, those are folks who do know and they're choosing to deny. Um, but I do think that there's Americans who just simply do not know. 
And I think that's why they were shaken to their core when they, uh, when they saw George Floyd murder. Um, another uh, uh, very good question from the audience. It, it, uh, Steve, I'll uh, ask you to have a list one. Uh, how can the public work to get a more equitable judiciary? Um, you know, we're seeing um, President Trump stacking the courts with far right wing justices at the, not just the Supreme Court, but at the lower levels. Um, it's so sort of the appellate levels, the associate levels. Um, how can the public, uh, is there anything the public can do? For, for appointed judges, uh, throw the rascals out who are appointing them. Uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, people are, are not aware that in many jurisdictions, uh, uh, judges are elected. And so voting for the local DA, voting for a judge in a local jurisdiction uh, uh, is, is, is vitally important. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a, a tremendous uh, fight uh, against reducing qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. And, and I, I, I just hope, Congresswoman Bass, that you are successful in legislating that subject successfully to, uh, to ha hold people accountable. Uh, and and I, 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 I go back to the voting because right now uh, it's essential that we change the people who are making judicial selection. That's probably the most consequential aspect of the November election in the context of presidential appointment of judges and senatorial confirmation.